we now have the release of at least the beginnings of what will be the Federal Reserve of the United States Central Bank Digital Currency. This is going to be the new digital dollar. There's been a lot of speculation about what this was going to look like, but we now have released the both the name, a technical paper, a less technical introduction, a discussion paper that came from the Fed, and also now some open source code that has been released. And this CBDC, Central Bank Digital Currency, is being called Project Hamilton, or at least that's the name of the the project itself. It's between the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, that's otherwise known as the Boston Fed, and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So two friends of mine, Amory Sachet, who is the uh, lead developer and benevolent dictator of Bitcoin ABC, so one of the most knowledgeable and technically competent people in Bitcoin, and Tobias Rook, who is a wonderful developer in his own right and has done some very innovative things, uh, who's a friend of mine who's even visited me here in my home of Saipan and spent quite a lot of time here. Uh, two people that I really respect and that I uh, respect what they've done. It's a bit more of a technical presentation. If you want that, I would definitely suggest checking it out. I wanted to do something that was a little more accessible to the public, so a little bit of an ELI-5. I went through the white paper for Project Ham Hamilton. I went through the code as necessary, what there was there. There isn't a, a ton there. But I went through both of these things, and I want to give you an idea of what's on the horizon. Also, I wanted to give an idea of what are the motivations behind the people who are doing this, as far as I can tell from what they've developed technically. So we may as well start with the introduction, their white paper. I, I would like to call this thing uh, Bitcoin's evil brother. And I think by the end of this, you'll probably see why. So the beginning is the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, the Boston Fed, and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology's Digital Currency Initiative, MIT DCI, are collaborating on a multi-year exploratory research project known as Project Hamilton to gain a hands-on understanding of a central bank digital, digital currency's technical challenges and opportunities. This paper presents the first phase of Project Ham Hamilton's research and describes the technical design of Hamilton, a research transaction processing system flexible enough to support experimentation with multiple CBDC models. So they call this just a research and hypothetical, but looking through this, the work that has been done and the way that they describe the decisions that they've made, and also the names of the contributors, the amount of time that some of them have even been away from MIT and working on other things, indicates that actually what's being presented here is probably a couple of phases previous work. So this is not recently done, um, but clearly you can see that this is the foundation. So what we're really going to get a chance to look at is what are kind of the foundational presuppositions. What, what are the foundational problems that they're trying to solve and what are the decisions that they make to solve them? I find interesting they have a footnote here that says this project is named in tribute to two Hamiltons, Margaret, Margaret Hamilton, an MIT computer scientist who led the software development for the Apollo program's guidance system at NASA. So I don't know if that was the guidance sy system for the, the cameras in the um, in the, the hangar where the moon landing was was filmed. Uh, never mind, we'll leave that alone. And Alexander, Alexander Hamilton, who laid the foundation for a U.S. central bank. I think the first thing that I wanted to, to cover, because I think it's important as we, as we look at this, is the contributors, the contributors to this. So there are several different contributors who, who played a part in this. And of course, in looking at them, we're going to find out a lot about what kind of talent was bring, being brought to bear and what was seen as valuable by the people who were backing this. So maybe we should start with the last name first. That's going to be Neha Narula. She is the director of the Digital Currency Initiative, which created this. Amongst other things, you know, she's got a two million view TED Talk and all of this, 
as you would expect. Uh, she is a member of the World Economic Forum's Global Blockchain Council. So we see the Davos crew uh, involved in this, of course, as you would expect. Um, the first contributor, James Lovejoy, is he's probably the youngest. It looks like he just finished his undergrad studies in 2019. Uh, at this moment, he's the senior software architect of the CBDC at the Boston Fed. So clearly a, a quite talented developer. At the time that he was in undergrad, he was also the president of MIT's Bitcoin Club. So this is a Bitcoiner for sure. Uh, he spent a year as a research assistant with the Digital Currency Initiative. And then he went on uh, since 2020. He's been an engineer moved after one year to the senior so software architect of the CBDC at the Boston Fed, which is where this is happening. So the Boston Fed is going to be the the spearhead of where this CBDC project happens. So for the whole Federal Reserve System. So this person, James Lovejoy, is a, an important individual and chances are will be an important individual uh, uh, as we move forward on this whole project. Next is Corey Fields, who I've been talking about for quite some time, was one of the initial three people brought in, along with Gavin Andreessen and Vladimir Vanderland, three well-known Bitcoin developers who were brought in to the Digital Currency Initiative at MIT. It was actually created sort of around them to fund them in 2015. So he has been there the whole time. He's a longtime Bitcoin developer. Uh, his, uh, his GitHub handle is at the uni. And he, uh, he joined MIT, as I said, in 2015. And as you can see, the whole time that he's been working on, and this is something I've tried to communicate to many, many people, the whole time that he has been working on the currency to enslave the United States, the central bank digital currency, the digital dollar, to put an unlimited amount of power over your economic life into the hands of the central banks, he has been contributing to Bitcoin Core. So as, as recently as this week, as I'm recording this, there, are, there is a commit. So in other words, software has, uh, code has been contributed to the Bitcoin Core full node, the full node that runs, that is run by the miners of BTC and that is forked and that is the forks are Bitcoin ABC, uh, Bitcoin Satoshi's vision, Corey Fields, as recently as this week, has been contributing at the same time that he's building this. So as I've been telling people, the central bank digital currency was built by Bitcoin developers. Uh, next we have, so I'm just going to go through. There are some who were research assistants, weren't particularly notable, as you would expect. They were people who were involved there. They've gone on to do other things. Uh, next, Kevin Kowarski. So Kevin is at Circle... Who, who is, of course, the creators of USDC, the most important uh, legit stablecoin. He's at Circle from 2014 to 2019, okay? Uh, USDC is launched in September 2018, and at that time, he's the manager of trading infrastructure. So this is somebody who has a, a, a deep knowledge of how to build centralized transfer mechanisms between multi-parties. So we're talking about custodial centralized exchange, working with cryptocurrency. He was the trading infrastructure manager at Circle. And so also deeply, uh, deeply embedded in stablecoins. USDC, of course, announced in 2016, so he's there. Uh, launched in 2018, so of course he's working with it the whole time. Uh, he's currently the principal architect of the CBDC at the Boston Fed. So he's the principal. He's one of the principal architects. The other principal architect is the, uh, the next contributor, Anders Brownworth, who basically at the same time almost came in. He absolutely left at the, on the same at the same month as Kowarski, but uh, he came in uh, just a little bit before Kowarski, and he was also at the Fed as principal architect before Kowalski. So I've had this sort of situation before where 
you know, colleagues of mine or old business partners or whatever, where we've moved from company to company together. So these guys are probably a, a bit of a team that, that works together. That's really what this looks like. So let's talk a little bit about the main characteristics of now, now that we understand. So what we understand about these contributors, what can we say about what we see from the contributors? Two things, Bitcoin, stable coins. That's the interest of this team. And obviously the interest of the people putting it together, they could go and get anybody, but what they got was they got experts in Bitcoin and they got experts in stable coins. Okay, uh, um, USDC, that circle. Two people, two important individuals at circle. The chief evangelist, so that's, this, is, um, this is our uh, uh, Browns, Brownworth. He was a chief evangelist at circle. Okay, and then the the head of trading infrastructure there, the manager of trading infrastructure. So this is also important with the trading infrastructure. This is more than just the software. This is also what hardware do we need to enable the speed, the throughput, all of the things that we need. So he, he is also he's he's kind of a, a DevOps, as they would say. He says he's very good at putting up cloud infrastructure and whatnot. OK. So what are the main characteristics? As we go through, I'm going to just give a summary of what are the main characteristics that they are talking about that, they, that this thing is. So the first thing, obviously, it's a digital dollar. This is a stable coin. It's a cryptocurrency, but this is a stable coin. The, the purpose of this is not HODL, per se. What they're concerned about is primarily being able to effectuate transfers, so transactions and transfers of value. What Bitcoin was meant to do in the first place, um, and really it shows through because they use so much of Bitcoin in this. Um, also, incredibly high throughput was something that they needed. So they set their bar, their minimum that was acceptable, they set that at 100,000 transactions per second. 100,000 transactions per second. This is so, so much more so much more than uh, Bitcoin can do, all right? Bitcoin, maybe at, at, its, at its best, we'd be talking about 1,000, and that's with gigantic block sizes, okay? This is 100,000 transactions per second. And to do this, they use, and this is really the, the only real, let's say, innovation of this particular project, of Project Hamilton, is a, a transaction processor model that if you want to see more of the technical about that, again, I would say the Omri Sachet and Tobias Rook um, video, definitely go check it out if you're interested in that. Important thing for the, the non-technical, it is not a blockchain. So there have been so many people, and I've been trying to, you know, to help people to understand this was never going to be a blockchain. There are people out there who have this bad taste in their mouth, even people that I respect on other things, but they say, oh, blockchain is going to enslave us and blockchain this and blockchain that. And it shows that they really don't understand. Blockchain is not that. So what they needed, there was two reasons no blockchain. One, blockchains are slow. They needed speed. And two, there's no need to deal with the adversarial environment that exists with Bitcoin. That is to say, all of this infrastructure lives with a central authority. The entire purpose of a blockchain is to enable a system where you have no central authority, but yet it can remain secure against nefarious actors. This is what Satoshi Nakamoto creates, and this is what proof of work is for. Okay, they remove, they remove the blockchain. They remove the proof of work. There is no reason for that. And that, and in so doing, they get the speed. This is important. Talk about this uh, when we kind of sum this up. The second thing, low data retention. Now they say, so meaning they're not keeping a lot of data about your transactions. Again, this is very different than the blockchain where all the data about your transactions and the ability to sort of trace transactions from the beginning of the economy, from block zero, moving forward, this is not done, and they see this as not being necessary. So there is a, a, as you go through, you see that even they, ostensibly within their structure, are not able to see what is happening in a given transaction 
or to make a, a trace of transactions. Really more importantly, those who they, I'm sure that they will be tracking, they have control, but those who might want to audit this system, forget about it. Forget about it. An outside auditor coming in, they're not retaining a lot of data. Okay, it's, there is a lack of transparency here. The third part of this, or the, the, the uh, I should say the fourth part, which is very interesting, actually, and quite different from custodians like banks. They're moving to, the, it really is a cash model. And this is the model that Satoshi introduced really to the world. And that is, it's all about self-custody. So it's going to be not your keys, not your coins. The expectation here is that individual users will have their own private keys and they will need their private keys to operate. And I would assume that if you lose your private key or it becomes unavailable to you in some way, that your funds are gone. And there are a lot of places in here where it very much looks like that. Um, the, the last part that's important is the model that they used is a UTXO or coin model. And this is specifically drawn from Bitcoin. Satoshi is the one who introduces this model to the world. This is what's used in Bitcoin and all Bitcoin variants. So we're talking everything from Dogecoin to, to Dash to Litecoin to Decred. Uh, all of these sorts of variants that have been around for a very long time. Litecoin, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, Very important because in many ways it validates that this is how you do digital cash, right? This is, they literally have all the resources in the world. These are the people who print the money and they've brought what they feel is a dream team to the table, uh, headed by a, a, you know, a member of the World Economic Forum Blockchain Council and note they don't use a blockchain, okay? But they retain this aspect a lot of, although it's it's simplified, it's the basic transaction structure that Satoshi Nakamoto introduces in the Bitcoin white paper, right? This is very important. It's a it's a big validation of Bitcoin. So just we'll go into a little bit of a in summary here. So here are some key takeaways. It's Satoshi's Bitcoin. Okay, it's fundamentally at a conceptual level, it is Satoshi's Bitcoin, but minus proof of work and minus the public ledger. That is the blockchain. So for all the people who say blockchain is going to enslave us, blockchain is going to enslave us. There is no blockchain here. Okay, proof of work. Oh, proof of work. It's terrible. These miners, they're burning up the climate. They're doing all of this. It wastes too much energy. There's no proof of work. This is very energy efficient. The understanding that people should have is what are we, tr what is the trade-off of proof of work and what is the trade-off of a public ledger that proof of work creates? The trade-off, and as you can see, because it's been removed, but the rest of Bitcoin has been left fundamentally, what you can see is that, yeah, that's the part that's freedom. That's the part that's financial sovereignty for people. The proof of work and the blockchain. Proof of work and the blockchain. The other key takeaway. It is a black box with a very high level of programmability. So what, what do I mean? Users are not going to know what rules are governing their transaction validation. Okay? And the system is not going to be auditable in any meaningful way. So meaning you don't really know if you have different rules than I have about what you can spend and where you can spend it. And if you try to go to audit the system, there's no, there's no real way. They've, they've purposely made a system that is completely obscure. Completely obscure. Governments will have, basically, there will be no ability. They'll hand them over and say, oh, here we go. Here's the database. And it's just a database full of hashes that don't really say anything more. And they've designed it this way. They've given some things to say, oh, it creates more privacy, but they've designed it specifically this way. The other thing that's important here is the issuer, which is the Federal Reserve, has total and instantaneous control over the money supply. They have these two commands. There's really only three commands that can be done in a transaction. Mint, 
Redeem and transfer. Mint and redeem are only can only be done by the issuer. That's the Fed. Okay. Mint is creating new money. Redeem is like burning it out of existence. And the way that they are represented in the code, so the code that they've offered, this open source code, does show a, a sample function, and I wouldn't assume that it would need to be anything more than this, a sample function of the mint, not of the burn. There's no reason, reason to have that in there right now, I guess. Very easy. Very easy. Again, this image that people have of just putting a number into a computer and boom, the money's there, that's exactly what they've built. The scariest part for me is this redeem, what they call redeem. Uh, it's really burn, the ability to make existing cash out there unspendable. So imagine if uh, you know, there was some way that with a serial number, if, if somebody had the, if the Federal Reserve had the serial number of a bill in your pocket, that they could make that bill just out of, all, all of a sudden self-destruct, like disintegrate into nothing. Like it's just in your hand, you're about to hand it over, and whoo, it's gone. That's exactly what they've built. And there, it, do, it doesn't appear that there's any governor on their ability to do that. So they don't like you. They're, they're like, ah, you shouldn't have any money. It's like that fast. <laughs> all they have to know is what money's in your wallet, basically the serial number. That's fundamentally what they've got is a set of serial numbers, and they can burn it away. Um, I think the last thing, the most important thing, is even looking at this first phase, and clearly this is not, they're, far, they're much farther than this. Whatever they're releasing at this time are things that it's, this may be a year old, this may be two years old. They're clearly already past this point with their development. Just, you could tell just because some of these contributors have actually left. Okay, some of these contributors haven't even been there for a year or two or haven't even been associated with either MIT or, uh, or the Boston Fed. But looking at this, what I could say is it will work. This, this is definitely going to do what it says on the box. The most difficult aspects of Bitcoin are all about finding that consensus without a central authority. The things that they have retained, the transaction structure and whatnot, pretty straightforward. And the, the way that they have also done the transaction processing architecture, pretty straightforward. So I will say this is, a, this is incredibly powerful. Uh, it's potentially incredibly dystopian. I don't think anyone... Someone given the keys to this, literal, the literal private keys as the issuer, will have a level of control over the society that's using this that I don't think any human being in history has had. It's way beyond 1984, way beyond it. Because the idea that you could be going about your day and somebody decides they don't like you and now all of a sudden you just simply can't even earn money anymore because somebody sends it to you and it poofs the second that somebody even sends it to you. Um, or you try to spend it and it, it, it just gets denied and then it poofs and nobody can spend it. This has not happened. And you can imagine the kind of lever of control that that gives to someone. So what, what I will say on this is where there's hope, where I see hope in this, a, a great, as a matter of fact, a great deal of hope, is this is a validation of the power of Bitcoin. This is a validation of what Satoshi Nakamoto brought to bear, that they have taken away the parts that are of the people, they have corrupted it, but they have retained the tools, the sharpened edge, to use against you. So what is your defense? Turn to Bitcoin. Learn all that you can about how to use this digital cash system that we have. That is available to you, that is public, and we need to be working on it to make sure that it survives. Because it is the lifeboat. As I've been saying for years, it is the lifeboat. So I hope that if you want to know more, and please, I would hope that you would want to know more. If you want to know the truth, if you want to get into Bitcoin, 
join and uh, register for Bitcoin Mystery School. Join the community that we have, bitcoinmysteryschool.com. We do classes every single month. You're going to understand the intricacies of Bitcoin. You're going to understand the system. You're going to understand all of these pieces, and you will be able to read the CBDC white paper and understand what's happening through a lot of it. You'll be able to watch technical talks like, again, I will suggest Omri Sachet, Tobias Ruck. Go and watch that. But at least get that basic foundation because this is coming. It's here. They've shown us the pieces. They've shown us the code. Now, mind you, they've shown us even rudimentary code and we can look and I think anybody who knows what they're looking at is, yeah, realizes the situation that we're in. So if you don't want to be stuck under the, the thumb of the type of tyranny that's going to be implemented with this thing, please, please learn about the tool. Learn about the tool that they've taken and that, that they're using, which is Bitcoin, which they say over and over and over again in their own white paper that they're using. So I would love to have you in Bitcoin Mystery School. So BitcoinMysterySchool.com. I hope that this was helpful. Uh, you can go and just Google uh, open CBDC and MIT, it'll come up with their website if you want to go and check out the papers that are on there and you want to go and look at the code. So thank you very much for this.